Uh, we are meeting every Saturday over the last two years, bringing various topics. Uh, today, we covered this topic last week, but somehow because of the new year, we could not, uh, uh, we, we had a request to cover this topic once again. So here we are. Uh, the topic we are, we are covering is artificial intelligence in medical education and skill training. Uh, please note that our ID from today has changed. Uh, if anybody wants to join who has an interest in this field, can uh, come on this session, uh, specifically for doctors and technology people. Uh, the meeting ID is 818-8591-1572. Uh, to talk about this interesting topic, we have Professor Dr. Arun Jankar joining in from California. He is a distinguished professor in SIU Pune University. He's a consultant of healthcare. Uh, he is also uh, working with Persistent Systems Limited. He's the ex vice chancellor from Maharashtra University of Health Sciences, Masek. Uh, I request the distinguished speaker to come on this board for talking about this beautiful topic. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Saurabh. Can I share my screen? Yes, sir, you can. Can you see the screen? Yes. Thank you, Saurabh, for inviting me for this second time for the CMO meeting. Uh, last time I talked about artificial intelligence in clinical skill training and medical education. Uh, last time in the conversation, the people were more interested in medical imaging. So I thought I should give a little more attention. So let me thank uh, CMO for inviting me for this weekly meeting. I've been introduced and thanks for uh, my work has been with the uh, system about intelligence. We have a lot of projects going on. And uh, last time, I think I talked about this in National Conference on Health Professional Education. So let me uh, briefly introduce uh, what I've been talking from last time is about uh, what is AI, what is ML. Actually, the term AI, which was coined by John McCarthy, is defined as a machine with intelligent behavior, such as perception, reasoning, learning, communication, and ability to perform human tasks. So these are the five things, perception, reasoning, learning, and communication. In fact, now in medical education, we need uh, communication skills, and there are some experiments being done on communication skills. There has been a lot of uh, sentiments uh, against AI that uh, people are reasonably worried. Even Stephen Hawking has said that the development of artificial intelligence could spell the end of human race. And then Elon Musk and uh, his Bloomberg. Ashley Vance, where he was writing, when we were talking about the biography, he was talking about the same thing, that it's not only the question of what it can do, it's a question of uh, maybe some accidental possibility of doing some monitoring because of a, a fleet of artificial intelligence enhanced robots. They, are, they might be capable of uh, destroying mankind, but I think uh, that is uh, too, um, too large a thing. Anyway, all possibilities are done. Uh, more than 100 robotics and AI pioneers, including uh, uh, Tesla CEO, they are asking for UN 
to develop a even led ban on legal autonomous weapons. I came into picture about after the first time the Watson address and the green party. And not only that, the IBM, the deep blue, it beat Gary Kasparov. Again, this was the IBM supercomputer deep blue. And then the reigning chess master was defeated. Then afterwards, he thought that he has not been given enough data like the deep blue. And then subsequently, there are a lot many things happening. And then I've been debater, which were also the yeah, has won. And uh, I think there are a lot more things going on. I'm fascinated by technology. And uh, if you go to my website, arunjamka.com, where we I proudly say that technology can only solve all problems of healthcare. For those who are interested in going into details of my talk, because I might be showing, uh, talking brief. But they're showing those slides. You can access all those slides from my website. It's all about uh, called as artificial intelligence, and then there, there is more of development taking place afterwards. Uh, after the Nvidia has come into picture, and when I visited Nvidia, where my son works, is a nice mural called "I am an AI," and even the T-shirts are available, which say "I am an AI," and. Uh, uh, the rapid growth of AI is because of its possibility of using, uh, say, graphic processors, in what you call as image handling. And then uh, there is a some called law called as Moore's law, where the CPU growth is given, and then it has been seen that the GPU growth, which is the graphic processor, is faster than CPU. In fact, uh, at present. There is so much of uh, there's so much of growth that all these audiovisual it could be a 60 billion opportunity. And recently, uh, uh, Nvidia unveiled a monster called A1100 AI chip. So, in addition to the AI, we need to talk about uh, uh, other two things called IoT that is Internet of Things, where there's a connectivity of uh, all those uh, equipments to, to the internet. And then we have what is called as IoT for healthcare, where we have headsets, clothes, uh, sensing devices, monitors, glucose monitors, ECG monitors, pulse socks, and everything. And that's why now we call it Internet of uh, Healthy Things. And then the other thing which comes is what is called the variables. And the variables which are connecting uh, uh, biological parameters and giving the data of the patient to the system. And it's a change whole thing. Simple thing like a uh, Apple Watch is a variable. It's an ECG monitor. And then not only that, uh, it can give you a clue that you are falling down. And in case you don't respond, and uh, it can directly communicate to your uh, near dear that uh, your dear has fallen down. So let me introduce the three terms. I'm going to go into a little brief because last time I covered all of these. We have AI, ML, and DL. And uh, the, the AI is computer mimicking human behavior, sense, reason, act, and adapt. Whereas uh, ML is algorithm that gradually improves. So something that is more, more important is uh, ML, which improves with the uh, what is called experience. And then the deep learning, uh, what's called DL, is learns from the vast amount of data. And the examples are alpha goals and having car. And uh, what is more important now is currently because of the EMRs and EHRs and everything, big data automation. First time this extremely big data algorithm. The data is coming from various sources. And uh, this the overall, this data could be useless. But then at the same time, there is so much of knowledge in that that it would be criminal not to use them. And that's why we require AI for identifying this data. And then we have a limitation for uh, human use.
that uh, uh, the medical errors are occurring and the amount of information available is doubling every five years. And I think that whole thing comes to the experience and we require uh, AI to identify what are the development taking place and to find out how we can use. And then uh, you can find out all the physician can diagnose based on uh, say, um, personal medical histories. So there is a large difference between how a human mind can diagnose and how AI can diagnose. AI can diagnose decisions based on complex algorithm using hundreds of biomarkers, aging levels of millions of patients, and aggregated clinical data. So I think uh, you can't just uh, compete. And that's why uh, AI might be helping. At the same time, AI could assist and physician in many ways, but unlikely to replace. The healthcare system has to travel for what is called as reactive health to proactive health. So reactive health, individuals uh, look for medical health, they are unwell. Whereas in proactive health, so the with variables and IOTs, the data is captured continuously with the medical grade variables. And then you are going to find out when the patient is going to be sick and then giving, giving uh, say some help before the disease occurs. I think this pro proactive health is only possible with AI. Uh, there are data types available, and then I think if you see the work of AI, the maximum work is being done in diagnostic imaging. Uh, AI is getting uh, useful, uh, applying for critical care, uh, say, uh, say artificial intelligence uses machine learning, and then you store data. At the same time, there is a lot of concern about getting it sympathetic to getting it to the mind. That's why now we want to call it what's called as artificial wisdom. So artificial wisdom can be described as an artificial intelligence the top level of decision making when confronted with most complex systems. That's why, because machines lack human qualities like empathy, compassion, I think this whole thing can come once it, uh, the artificial wisdom comes. And therefore, if you see the growth, so it travels from what is called as DIKW model, the data, information, knowledge, and wisdom. And I think for up to the knowledge, uh, it could be done with AI. But then wisdom, you require something more than the AI. So medical education, clinical skills, everything requires augmented intelligence leading to uh, artificial wisdom. So let me just go ahead and uh, explain you what is machine learning. In machine learning, uh, the system has the ability to learn and uh, it improves their performance. That's why uh, I've just seen one video uh, where uh, the ML is being used for creating robo. And then it was just asked to walk. And then it was given input from inside. And then it result uh, after uh, say 10,000 feet, uh, the uh, robo itself learned and it started walking like a man. I think this is how it can help. So machine learning are various two types. One, one is called the unsupervised machine learning and supervised machine learning. And there's a basic difference. Now the unsupervised machine learning uh, is uh, what's called as given in examples and then code. Whereas supervised learning where we give some data and then ask them to say copy. Let us say give example of uh, now that there are a lot of things being uh, done with the machine learning and deep learning in COVID pandemic. So even the development, a fast development of a, say, uh, MRI-based uh, vaccine was because of uh, machine learning. And uh, not only that, there were several uh, drugs and everything being done that was all with uh, machine learning. Now, in a, uh, let us give an example on difference between supervised and unsupervised. In a supervised learning, suppose you have a COVID, and then uh, we give uh, the say what you call as images of lung, which are positive in uh, say patients of uh, COVID. And then, uh, then uh, the training would be done to find out where these images are present, and it will it will find out how it can how it could be COVID or not. In an unsupervised machine learning, all patients, all access of positive patients would be given. And then um, what you called as uh, all those images would be classified. And then they go into what is called as a clustering to find out which image, which opacity is positive as correlation with, uh, uh, say, COVID. So as a net result, 
in in supervised learning we know which shadows are there which are positive for covid whereas in unsupervised uh, it, the machine itself will find out which uh, shadows are positive for learning so i think uh, there are various types of what is called as uh, in in supervised learning we are uh, commonest is neural network support vector machine and then random forest there is in unsupervised you have k means clustering hierarchical clustering and i mean deep learning it's an application of machine learning that uses complex algorithms to uh, go into deep neural network and the word machine learning was first time used by 1959 by arthur samuel that the deep learning was used first time by rena dester i think this is an history of how the development of thing are taking place and then cnn is a direct copy of biological neural network and then what is happening is once you put in given input then there is image processing and then there are what you call as hidden layers and at the end we want to find out what is happening there so we are the we are the things that whether it is a tumor whether it is normal a stroke or hemorrhage from input to output and then therefore we have all these deeper layers so a uh, deep, deep learning is a sort of a, a copy of a subset of a supervised learning so let us give an example suppose you have a label data the image of tom and jerry and then once you do lot of cleaning algorithm and then any image given that has to be classified which is tom and which is jerry so uh, the step is first you have to do data depression where then all the images are represented correctly and then we what is called as a feature engineering cycle to find out which feature are positive in which side so obviously in a, what they called as a, a supervised machine learning then it generates the features and then do models and creates algorithms and extract and then afterwards when the whole thing is there then we have deploy a new image and it can give classification so there are uh, several uh, what they called as um, software so rebel the commonest one is called the tensor flow is available to see from website in the google cloud platform and keras now i just remember i was talking to mit edt university about uh, medical imaging and then there was one question of, from uh, one indian uh, sorry yes. to interrupt you your voice is muffling over here we are having a hard time hearing you out okay uh if you can just check your uh, internet speed or probably the mic i am talking on laptop yeah but uh, uh your voice keeps on moving uh, you know it it keeps muffling in between vibrating the speaker is not very clear the mic is not very clear so shall i shift to other room would you yeah would you otherwise would you like to re- Okay, okay. Just wait. And you can also uh, close your camera. I would say it may help for the internet. Is it okay now? Yeah, it's much better, and I I suggest I will close your camera, and we will open it once the slides are over. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. About this. So joining us now is our expert Tomazo. Tomazo, great to have you. 
Thank you. Nice to meet you, Chris. So maybe you can tell us uh, in what areas artificial intelligence is our about this. So joining us now is our expert, Tommaso. Tommaso, great to have you. Thank you. Nice to meet you, Chris. So maybe you can tell us uh, in what areas artificial intelligence is already integrated into the daily workflow. As you may know, as part of the clinical workflow of radiotherapy, one needs to contour the organs at risk because basically you want to avoid them during the intervention. You want to preserve them. You don't want to kill these organs. And this is a tedious process. It takes time. It's costly. The clinician has to contour all the organs. And this is exactly a perfect example where AI can make an impact mm -hmm. by providing automation and therefore help streamline the contouring process and increase the throughput of radiotherapy sites. Okay. And, and this is just an example of out of the 30 plus products that we are here that are already AI powered. You can check them out on the booth. You know what? That's an invitation. So why don't we do that? Let's go check them out. Now let's have a closer look at how AI is expanding precision medicine with the help of this brand new device here presented at the RSNA 2017. And with that, I'd like to welcome our expert, Mark. Mark, Hi. great to have you. How you doing? I've got to tell you, I've never been on a scanner like this before. Yeah. So what's so special about this? Yeah, so what we're introducing this year at RSNA is the fast integrated workflow with the new fast 3D camera just okay. above you there. Okay. Basically, this is powered by artificial intelligence. We've got a lot of algorithms in there uh, working as soon as I press one button okay. to position you properly. So in the past, we used to have to do all of this manually, but now what it's done is determined where you are lying on the table, whether you're head first or feet first, it's already checked the position from shoulder to hip mm -hmm. and the perfect isocentering as well. So now you're ready to be scanned. Uh-oh. Oh, I got to tell you, Mark, this is kind of comfortable. It certainly is, but we don't want you on there for too long. Now, I know what you're thinking, but no, this is not a game chair. I'm trying to find out how AI is actually changing the way radiologists work. So for this, I'd like to welcome our expert, Valentin. Hi, Chris. How are you doing? Nice to have you. So maybe you could tell me how this actually works. What is this about? In our advanced visualization software, Syngovian, already today we make use of a broad portfolio of AI-powered algorithms to help radiologists in their reading. So maybe you can give us a specific example of, of how to assist radiologists? Absolutely. So one tool we have newly introduced now with Syngovian BB30 is that the software is supporting the radiologists by automatically segmenting for them the lung, the heart, and the aorta. And all that is powered by AI algorithms. That is amazing. This is really great. You mind if I stick around a little bit and try Not out? at all. Go for it. So I'm just going to introduce uh, so what are the various uh, image, uh, say, uh, AI system being used in imaging? So the first one, which is low-hanging fruit, is uh, skin diseases, where dermatologists, they have a lot of, uh, say, these uh, images. And uh, with a deep uh, CNN, they are able to diagnose all those diseases with, uh, with uh, two views. And not only that, is an AI uh, app available, or called as a first term. There might be several things like this, where uh, you have to just send the two views of your uh, skin disease, and it gives a diagnosis. Now, the other thing which, which has been uh, approved by FDA is uh, diabetic retinopathy. And is uh, actually, uh, the AI was uh, approved first by FDA for uh, say histopathology, but it was not used at that time. But a retinopathy is being used. And then it is used for screening of retina for uh, diabetic retinopathy. And then we have what's called INUX AI-based uh, uh, DR system. And then uh, it's very easy. And then uh, because the patterns are less, and therefore it is very easy to uh, screen and maybe it's easy to anticipate. And then uh, we can talk about radiology. And then radiology, there's several, several things available. X-ray chest, the CT scan, MRIs, PET scan, CT angio, MR angio, everything is available. And uh, then if you see, uh, the Siemens is doing a lot of work, what is called as Siemens Health and Years. And these are the various areas where uh, the AI system is being used. Now let us give, start giving some examples. 
of uh, say large scale automated reasoning and uh, which is called as a dual conventional network and then uh, if you give the x ray now this i think uh, one of the biggest uh, network where more than 47 lakh x rays were there and then uh, uh, it was for x ray chest so frontal and lateral view is given and then it goes into uh, a dnn system and then it can it is able to give all those diagnoses which is given and then if you can see uh, the the success rate of uh, say individual compared to the dual net is almost comparable then these are these things can be seen with another uh, another network called chestnet where we can find out the deep learning of uh, stress radiograph you can see the comparable results with individual and not only that if you can see uh, all these atelectasis cardiomegaly consolidation all those findings of x-ray chest the diagnosis of radiologist and an algorithm is almost same there might be somewhere like uh, emphysema or hernia <coughs> where radiologist is better and then we uh, uh, we can do several examples uh, mra where all those things are available with another network and uh, uh, so much so that there was a recent paper about AI system being used as one of the uh, student for appearing appearance of a Royal College of Radiologist. And when, where, it was giving a comparable result with, uh, I think, 45, uh, say, students. And uh, the even success rate was as good as uh, those. Uh, other AI has been coming to a lot of picture is mammography. In mammography, uh, I think there are a lot many these shadows in micro calcifications, and there's so much of variation that uh, uh, the input, you see all those images, it goes into CNN, and you have to find out the output is only three things, malignant, benign, or normal. And uh, these papers show that the uh, radiology resident, you can see the graph, the radiologist, you can see the graph, and then uh, if you can see the neural network, it is 0.89%. So much so that there was international validation. This is the paper published in 2020, about 25,000 uh, women in the US and 3,000 women in UK, where the panel of radiologists, uh, of eight radiologists, and the system was found to be better than radiologists. Then we can have an endoscopy. Now, I hope uh, there, you all know about gastroendoscopy, and then uh, we have direct endoscopy, or what is called as a virtual endoscopy, where we do, uh, say, 3D images from CT scan and MRIs. And then uh, these are various types, what's called upper GI, lower GI. Upper GI is upper gastric tract, where the uh, endoscope is passed to the upper aid, and the um, lower GI is passed to the anus. And then we can, when the area between is uh, not covered, then we have what is called as a capsule endoscope. And uh, deep learning analysis, now that we can have uh, helicobacter pylori coming from image, image handling, where the sensitivity is 75%. And then uh, not only that, uh, you can identify one of the network called gastric net, where it was identifying automatically the cancer identification. And these, uh, this can give you all those clues about uh, which cells are present and then which can give you diagnosis of gastric cancer. Uh, you might have heard about a movie called Fantastic Voyage, where, uh, uh, where whole, uh, say everybody was miniaturized and passed through a vessel and it was like a submarine going inside. Now this whole thing is available with what is called, something called as a capsule endoscope where there's a capsule with a camera, with a battery, with an, uh, say, power to transmit those images. And then you, know, you have to just swallow. And then that whole images come out. And they, they come uh, because upper GI and lower GI are only accessible. The middle intestine, which is long, there might be some bleeding, polyps. And then you get all those images. And then um, uh, the AI has been used to find out what are those images and finding out video analytics. And you can find out it is coming almost very close. And these uh, deep network are able to identify even polyps. 
and uh, the dnsa this is one of the paper where you can see those appearances bubble turbid clear image poly and then uh, the appearance you can see is almost 98% 99% is coming to the close and uh, virtual endoscopy also we do same thing and i think computer read uh, colorectal polyps we can do that here now i can just show you how polyps are diagnosed with ai artifacts and the analysis of the motion of the endoscope one main contribution is the automatic localization of polyps in clinical colonoscopy. Colonoscopy consists of two different phases, insertion and withdrawal. During the insertion phase, the colonoscopist drives the endoscope to the second. During the withdrawal phase, the actual intervention is performed. An image can be viewed as a 3D representation in which shallows correspond to valleys. In colonoscopy images, these valleys correspond to shadows created by the polyps. We first clean the image to remove undesirable shadows. Finally, we integrate valley information in an intelligent way to highlight those areas of the image more likely to contain a polyp. The final outcome is a heat map in which the hottest point corresponds to the presence of the polyp. We verified that this map corresponds to the actual regions that attract the attention of the physicians. We validated this by means of eye tracking experiments. So, uh, this is trying to show you how an automatic uh, gastrointestinal polyp detection can be done with AI, and I think it, in, it is giving you a lot more success rate. And you can find out a system where the success accuracy is almost 98%. I think this is one of the biggest triumph for uh, uh, detection of uh, as a colonic polyps. Uh, it is being used you now in histopathology, and I'm not going to say talk much, but I think uh, what is important in histopathology is uh, we are trying to develop uh, the machine learning techniques, and instead, uh, the detection will clean with the cell wise to find out what is happening. And then uh, it has been seen that in metastatic breast tumor lymph nodes, the histo digital histopathology is far better. And then we have slide scanners. And what is coming now next is uh, we are doing what is called as whole cell images and tissues and developing into what is called as the 3D images. And so now I hope uh, everybody knows that in histopathology, uh, we have uh, blocks and we spend, we cut down uh, one slide, which is uh, in micron thick. Whereas suppose you do a 3D image, I think a whole thing can go down and then it can even just transfer all of the areas And the AI approaches are giving you a lot more importance. And the NFT has already approved. And I think the chances of having a 3D image of whole block, I think it's changing, going to change the time. you can see now that uh, the let us you know, take a bath and uh, the ship is on operation table, we are from the, from the tissue, and then that whole thing is cut. And the already killing layers and the operation center itself, whole thing can be loaded. And that uh, will scan, get an image. Take a series of image and then you do diagnosis. Fastest available. 
that uh, tissue type is available to the treatment in operation center. So I think uh, this is change. It should be taking the whole thing of management and become so rapid that uh, otherwise the patient has to redo or reoperate. This is a uh, life changing. Uh, same thing is happening in uh, coronography. Say, coronary NGOs, we are interested to find out whether there is a plaque or there is a stenosis. And then these images can go down and uh, uh, we can find out a coronary CT angiography is able to find out the stenosis compared to the plaques. And these are other uh, examples of uh, deep learning analysis to find out whether where we have, uh, say, the stenosis. And uh, this is another paper where sensitivity of all these techniques in coronary is 84%. Uh, it is being used in uh, even nuclear medicine. Now, nuclear medicine itself is a big topic. There might be several, several types of images, but I think it has been used in uh, spec scan, spec scan, all those scans. Now, uh, last time I talked about uh, AI system being used in medical education. I'm not going to talk much because it can be used in curriculum where uh, we have uh, AI techniques being used for three levels of medical education. Then uh, with the CBME coming, the AI system could be used for what is called as an academic governance, where all those, uh, say, uh, what is called as competencies are being taught and with, uh, say, horizontal integration, vertical integration. And then I think this is so much of a complicated thing that AI system can help to say, academic governance. Then it can be used for assessment, where uh, we could have uh, say database of question papers and depend and calculated with the difficult index and differential index and we can design new question papers to, uh, say on whatever uh, whatever set you want and then you can create a rubric and these assessment could be done with uh, all those possibilities available now other thing is uh, it can be used to find out an assessment because uh, why do while do assessment there are two things happening uh, one is called reliability and validity and uh, reliability validity both are absolute however uh, method um, depends now what is uh, what is required is if you want to have reliability now uh, these are the various methods of uh, evaluation mcqs essays pmps oral exam long case oski mini cx and there is a variation of reliability but then the, if the testing time is 1 hour the reliability differs. Whereas the, the testing time is eight hours, all systems are reliable, almost same reliability. So what is what is important is if you want to increase the reliability of a tool, you increase the time. And that's why what we are suggesting is we should have what is called as a dynamic real-time assessment of student. That student volunteers to get uh, dynamically evaluated, he chooses the topic, then the system will find out his resources, lectures attended, books, clinical cases, everything done, and then it will monitor. And then find out at a given time when the student wants to get assessed, the question paper could be created by the system to the data bank, and then it could be directly assessed. I think uh, these are the question papers which you can come through a dynamic thing. And I think that, that is one of the things which we will need to change the picture. Now, it can help for a resource management of student that all those global resources, uh, say all things can be identified, find out what the student is doing. And, and then it could be connected with the EHR EMR system to find out, uh, uh, suppose to guide the student. And let's say, let us say somebody is reading about uh, endocrine. So the which patient is there, which theater is operating, I think this whole thing can help with the AI system to have a better training of students. Now, uh, the skill training is one thing which, uh, which is now the, uh, the test of time, where now we are various types of uh, skill training available. We are not discussing about uh, uh, teaching or cognitive dominance. We are discussing about, uh, say, how the AI systems can be used in skill training. 
simulation, chatbots, communication skills, and ops, and then virtual reality, robotics. Now, the simulation technology. Take a look at this. Cactus 15.9 inch for contact time, maintain one five thousand. Cactus 1549. Cactus 1549, Cactus 1539, hit first, two, Okay, uh, you need to return a little while. Knowledge about simulation. Uh, time to park is that emergency returning. Uh, 1529 is the uh, third strike. He lost all engines. He lost the thrust in the engines. He's returning immediately. Cactus 1529, which engines? He lost thrust in both engines, he said. Got it. Cactus 1529, we can get it if you want to try to land one or one train. I think it's for the simulation technology that right. helped to save these passengers. Now we have various types of simulators available. Uh, I'm going to talk about laparoscopy simulators, where we have D1C, DV trainer, ROS, and uh, now these all trainers they teach you in what is called the real time actual dynamic operations, and therefore uh, you cut it bleeds like normal thing, yeah, and it can use like all operative technology. I think uh, this is one of the things which can nicely train you. There are all these simulators. And then there are various simulators. Uh, there were some from ROS, although it's very costly. But then it gives you all those options of endorisk manipulation, camera clutching, fourth arm integration. I think this is one of the uh, best one. And then uh, in persistent, what we're trying to do is developing an AI-guided surgical orientation system. It will be used for uh, laparoscopy. Uh, uh, because of uh, all my uh, NDAs, I can't talk much. But I think uh, something will be like this, that uh, the moment you put the laparoscope inside, uh, it can identify the organ depending upon all the images outside. And then that whole thing is uh, based on AI data of surrounding organs. Now, the tip itself will have ultrasonic, and then it can guide you. And that's why I suppose I want to do uh, cholecystectomy. And I have taken a trocar in umbilicus, and then I can, uh, I can. The system can directly guide you how to go about uh, giving you details of the organs around, and how to go inside, and then go direct to the valve. It will be something like a Google map guiding you. Now uh, I talk about GI endoscopy, where uh, uh, all these uh, simulators are available where everything in the colonoscopy, endoscopy, gastroscopy, everything can be done and trained, and the skill training can be available through, uh, say, AI systems. Um, uh, not only that, uh, we have uh, orthoscopy, which is called uh, vitra mode orthos, where the knee, shoulder, hip, all orthoscopes, they can be trained with an AI. Then laparoscopy, we have already seen. Then uh, urology, uh, you could do uh, TRP, uh, say with the uh, stones, everything can be done through a training module. Then we have obstetric gynec where you can do hysteroscopy and even uh, say laparoscopic uh, hysterectomy. So simulation technology has been used, uh, and then uh, actually uh, as per uh, ACGMI guidelines, we require uh, patient care, medical knowledge, practice-based learning interpersonal communication skill, professionalism. I think this whole thing can come and during a ward rotation uh, where the, the resident can show and then all those aspects can be can come and then it can give a competency assessment with the simulation of the all those skills. And the virtual reality can come in the same thing. And then uh, now we have seen the GI endoscopy and endoscopy has been taught to real patients. But I think with all these endoscopists and all these systems, it can train you. And it has been found out that the range would come, that the scoring range from 7 to 35. So once you are trained with all virtual reality, it is giving you better training. Virtual reality uh, is almost coming in picture where with a Google Google or maybe uh, you can find out what exactly is going on. And then we can have 
uh, system being uh, say found out where a support vector algorithm uh, was uh, used for say hemilaminectomy done by different surgeons of varying skills so ai based uh, we are running uh, straining has been used in neurosurgery using four metrics of safety and safety of movement and this provides a metric wise assessment based on weight of each metric and this can be applied to evaluate skill levels then uh, uh, machine learning to assess uh, surgical expertise what is called mls machine learning uh, assessment surgical expertise checklist was there we have a checklist which can find out uh, the quality of discussion design of study structure of data and then supervise machine learning and find out and giving into the details to find out how the vr system is happening and uh, there are there is a, there are several papers available regarding uh, all these all these uh, networks are available to find out how we are evaluating then we can train through the robots and then surgical skill assessment through uh, robots with advanced robotic surgery it's possible to get data from robot in many forms it can be video data or kinematic data the processing this vast amount of data is expensive and time taking but the use of machine learning is doable uh, the initial study used kinematic data for skill assessment i think i am not going to go in much detail but all this surgical skill assessment through robotics could be done with ai now in robotics one the one of the say main disadvantage is whether you have haptic feedback now uh, we all know haptic feedback because all our mobiles and we have even Uh, desktops and computers where they are sensitive to touch and therefore touch feedback uh, can be given through robotics and uh, kinesthetic and cutaneous feedback can be given and then modality of touch is uh, very important and robotics can teach you to possible to gauge a tactile force being used by surgeons uh, one of the example of uh, assessment is what is called as uh, uh, dops and direct observation of uh, procedure of skills now in adopts uh, we just want to find out so uh, video analytics can be used to find out how the operation is being done now the video analytics being used by uh, sports skill training say tennis soccer cricket all the players they study the movements and uh, they study the counter action and uh, we can do similar thing where we are finding out what's called as hand motion entropy and timing metrics to discriminate levels of surgical skill and this finding can join with individual procedure scores and this measure can be collected by using consumer level cameras and analyze automatically and i think these whole things say say we can do uh, locally to find out uh, a video analytics and it's available and not very costly and then docs could be uh, analyzed video and then i can give an example of uh, a docs being used for the laparoscopic uh, appendicectomy where you can compare a docs between anatomist expert residents and i think a whole thing can be analyzed to find out how exactly we are going and the direct observation of your procedure can be done and we can be compare and then uh, there was paper to find out where synchronized video and motion analysis for assessment of procedure in operation theater where it could be done far better with a dops like technology can we use it for uh, diagnostic skills now uh, we have been using uh, what is called as eye doctor or ai based drug dispensing atm based on symptom based algorithm now algorithm based uh, machine, say mechanisms are available and these are fda approved and if you can see there's so much of explosion in these algorithms that we are we are trying to do one where uh, it was a symptom based algorithm going into uh, say analysis and finding out the which drug is used and we are using for primary drugs so we had an kiosk we had to sit down and then uh, after individualization the the questions will ask in order to see that the system is entirely dependent upon getting your symptoms and there is no 
no touch from the doctor the <coughs> the system will find out whether it is safe to give you uh, drugs without examination and, uh, and the system will take your blood pressure ecg pulse ox and everything and once you uh, it thinks that uh, it can be given then it uh, it directly can deal with uh, say 50 drugs now these were the algorithm to find out uh, say what are the things and which is all it may be rule based but then it was yeah, then it was put all afterwards to a machine learning to find out and to improve itself and these are the whole systems let us say it's an abdominal pain it asks you these questions and then gives you drug so this whole thing could be used for uh, evaluating diagnostic skills because all these flow charts are available for differential diagnosis and it can be used for history taking it can be for assessment of student tense for evaluating clinical diagnostics at the end i am going to talk about ai system being used for communication skills now where there is this nice paper available for now they created one program called empathic and uh, where the program will teach you to how to talk about uh, reflective reasoning empathy enhancing i would say all those things could be taught and then instead of uh, some teacher teaching you and uh, usually uh, we teach communication skills by um, make a say asking the students to observe a role model and then we try to improve i think same thing can be done with a machine where uh, you are dealing and talking with a machine with images and with videos and therefore we can find out and then question being asked by the machine and then we have to answer and i think uh, this whole thing can train you in uh, communication skills so so much so that uh, the, you know this paper shows that uh, a, as a comparison of chemistry skills on advanced uh, communication oski where uh, a student trained with uh, the software with the ai system was doing far better than even actual teacher being taught so this is uh, in brief how uh, we are trying to teach skills through ai system so technologies such as deep learning machine learning ai promise uh, benign solution for this thorny complex problems but this view is misguided while ai has evolutionary aspect of technical medicine it has brought in its way practical conceptual and pedagogical and ethical conundrums for example widespread adoption of technology is threatened to shift emphasis from hands on embodied clinical work disembodied technology enhance position scenarios mudding ethical responsibilities where ai can offer powerful sharpening of diagnostic accuracy and treatment all technologies and warm handshakes on medicine need to walk and hand to hand together so in conclusion as regards this training is concerned ai deep learning ml promise skill training simulation technology vr robotics can smoothen the process of skill education communication skills and skill evaluation can be effective with ai ai can add edge in clinical diagnostic skills and other cognitive domain machine lacks human qualities such as empathy compassion and therefore patient must perceive the consultations are being led by human doctors furthermore the patients cannot be expected to immediately trust ai technology started in mistrust so thank you so thank you so much uh, dr jankar for a excellent and a detailed presentation yes we understand there were some audio issues in the between but uh, i will send you the slides whoever needs it uh, in the group uh, after this thing uh, dr jankar can we close the presentation yeah okay uh, so i would probably want to open his video yeah okay dr jankar you can open your video and uh, i welcome dr chong our chair and uh, we would take this question answers now uh, yeah directly yeah dr uh, chong over to you thank you dr jamka for that wonderful presentation is quite illuminating to see that there's so many applications in the in the, using ai in medicine it's quite amazing actually um i didn't realize that the scope and the 
breadth of this AI has uh, penetrated into so many fields in medicine. Um, I'm just curious um, about, uh, you know, I'm, I'm also in, I, I've, I've dabbled a bit of, of this AI thing. What are your own thoughts about um, um, personalized medicine with the N of one uh, algorithms? So I think, uh, as I said, we are talking about reactive health. Uh, we expect patients to come to you and complain and then we diagnose and we evaluate and treat. So with AI and all that, with variables and IOTs, uh, the patient can wear all of them. And then uh, any small change that is happening, which could not be even uh, traced by the individual, uh, the AI system can diagnose and then patient uh, will come before he has symptoms and maybe with early symptoms. So I think uh, this is going to change his personalized medicine because the whole thing uh, will be now, uh, we are just uh, having uh, variables, but then we could have uh, some programs with the genetics, programs with uh, probabilities. And I think that whole thing will change all of the medicine together. I think it is going to be a world different. Thank you. Any questions from the floor for Dr. Jamka? Yes. Please go ahead. Hello, I am Professor Bukhari from Pakistan. Uh, really, it was a very nice uh, lecture, very presentation, I hope. So many presentation will be needed to understand this thing. Uh, Dr. Roon, uh, what are the different uh, tools to use this artificial intelligence in telemedicine? Uh, I think that the whole concept of telemedicine itself is AI based. Now, the model no, which no, I talk I understand. About, I understand. I doctor, that symptom based algorithm, it could be telemedicine. Now, to to what, assess is the patient. No, what is happening is uh, uh, the ones, everything that can be transmitted across from mm. uh, patient to the machine, uh, mm. the connecting wire can take it to telemedicine. So I think the AI is going to have, uh, say, drastic change uh, for, uh, say, telemedicine. Unfortunately, in India, before COVID, there was a lot of restrictions on telemedicine. But now after COVID, the, all those restrictions has gone away. That now people are interested. Now, let us say you want to monitor, a, say, cardiac monitor, and you want to find out, uh, say, why the patient is in ICU. Now, the moment we have uh, connections available, a doctor sitting at home, looking in his mobile, can identify what is going in the to the patient, and so much so that a nurse can can be there in the ICU, and then uh, the multiple patients could be diagnosed and monitored distantly by a cardiologist. So, in uh, say Asian subcontinent where we are short of cardiologists, we are short of experts. I think this whole thing can be done. Now, let us say radiology. Uh, the moment you are uploading, you know, the whole, the maximum uh, trust is in radiology. Now, we have a uh, company called Krishna. They do 5,000 x-rays per day, and all x-rays are uploaded. And then somebody sitting in the office diagnoses, and then gives back uh, the, uh, say, management. Now, what is most important is, let us say, x-ray chest. 90% of x-ray chest are normal. And I think a AI-based radiological tool can definitely tell you that it is normal. The question comes when it is abnormal. And I think uh, a radiologist, we can examine, say, 100 x-rays per day. With AI-based technology, can examine at least 200. So I think it's not going to replace radiology, but I think substantiate is all poor. <coughs> okay, connected to this question, uh, you do not think that uh, telemedicine, uh, in, uh, artificial intelligence will make more the people more lazy? And how can we reduce the cost of this one? Because it is most costly uh, things to use in our setup. It's not very costly. Let us say we want to do now, uh, as I said, all government machineries in India, they are using telemedicine for teleradiology. Now, Apollo is the following teleradiology. So this is uh, a boon for developing countries so where uh, you could have a machine available. Now, the advantage of uh, AI 
is even a small image can be used. So we have some MR, say, miniature X-rays available, which can be diagnosed. I think that can uh, substantiate the use of miniature uh, radiology. Uh, I see Dr. Monica had some uh, uh, post uh, about AI. Would you like to comment, Dr. Monica? Uh, thanks. Uh, first of all, uh, Dr. Jamkar, what a fantastic uh, presentation. You have so much, so much information, so many examples, and such a breadth of information that you provided uh, for us. Um, just some comments. I was typing in the chat box, so I gave everybody else's chance to speak, but um, I was just wanting to kind of talk about AI because how it has really jumped out to the forefront of everyday, everyday life with chat GBT. So that is like the first thing that I think the world is seeing about, we are in a new age of AI um, and everything that you're talking about now is all coming to the forefront. Now, specifically in the, in, the, in the world of diagnostics and medicine, this is going to be rapidly changing. We have a very large electronic health record system. We, um, there are algorithms that are being used in the background in terms of, me, of uh, health quality me measurables. But I think with all the advances that we have right now, I think there's some work to be done for the application um, and for AI-based uh, processes to be used ubiquitously and across all specialties. All I was saying, the question in the chat that was posted was, what are the risks associated with the usage of AI in healthcare? And I wanna go back to how we do critical appraisal of published data. Whenever we look at a clinical trial or a clinical study, we look at table one. What are the demographics of the patients that are included? Do the patient demographic apply to the patient population that we take care of in our patients? Do we have the right um, age group? Do we have the right gender? Do we have the right ethnicity? Do we have the same right comorbid conditions? Now, those are the things that I would, that's the first thing that comes foremost, foremost in my mind is, do the AI algorithms that are created to look for patterns or predictions of disease, like you're saying, instead of being proactive versus reactive, um, are we using the data that uh, represents the patients that we are seeing or what we are of ourselves? AI has the capacity to assess a large volume of data, large volume of real-time information. So I do believe that we have the potential to really see the benefit and enter medicine in a completely uh, different new phase. The other issue is that we're all cl trained clinicians. And when we become reliant on AI and something showing us what are the edges and borders, what are, show me the lung or the heart in the imaging, um, are we going to forget the basics and the intuitive medicine that we acquire with our experience? Um, that's all, and I think that there's gonna be also a change also in the, in the demographics of how physicians are trained um, and uh, where there is going to be um, the need for providing clinical care. So those are just some of the things that um, I was thinking of when you were giving your incredible presentation about now that we're in the world of applications of chat GPT and AI coming to the forefront is how are we gonna see it apply to our uh, clinical arena? But thank you again. Those are just some of the comments I had. Yeah, thank you, Monica. Dr. I think, uh, AI yeah, is getting uh, better and better. Uh, if you just scan the literature on any topic, there are more than 200 to 300 papers. And there are more than 100 networks working on that. So uh, there is, in fact, explosion of knowledge. And first time for healthcare, non-medicals are working hard. So I think this is a what is called as a scientific collaboration between intellectuals. And health has become priority. That, uh, in fact, I hope all of you know that all biggest developments in medicine were done by non-doctors. MRI was not discovered by doctors. CT scan was not discovered by doctors. Even uh, ultrasound was not discovered by doctors. So I think these are all technologies which are done by non-doctors. And first time with AI, all these non-doctors uh, coming into picture and they are trying to make our healthcare better. So I think that is one of the biggest success of this. Uh, Dr. Suresh Kumar, do you have a question? Yeah. Uh, really, uh, 
I joined a bit late in this presentation. So one of my trainee has just forwarded today morning. So I just learned, uh, started joining this uh, presentations a bit late. But thanks for the wonderful presentations. In fact, I am Dr. Suresh. I am a consultant in infectious diseases at Apollo Hospitals, Chennai. I'm heading the information technology in infectious diseases, the national group called Clinical Infectious Diseases Society of India. That is a society for infectious diseases similar to IDSA in US. So I'm heading the information technology in IDE. In fact, we conducted our last meeting in August 2022. So I'm looking forward for this similar presentations from the people like you, because we are actively searching for who are all the people actively doing AI, machine learning, and big data analytics, in particularly topic like infectious disease. After the advent of COVID, a lot of things has come up. We, the specialists, people have always ask who is infectious disease. We are the specialists dealing with all infections, sepsis, COVID, HIV, TB, and everything. That there are a lot of data is available. So I would like to do because hardly India has got hundred hot IDs out there, infectious disease training across India. But if you see the problem faced by the infectious disease is huge. COVID has thought clearly. What is the impact of COVID and antibiotic resistance is other major problem. So we need like, inputs from new people there. We need to train them also because a lot of training is needed for other doctors because antibiotic is a right and left use medicines for everybody, but without proper knowledge, only selected people like infectious diseases know how to use this molecule to prevent the resistance. But right now we don't have good antibiotics. So I, I like to ask the group who were presented there. So how to training the infectious diseases using this like a AI module to remote colleges, for example, a lot of medical colleges during undergraduations and post graduations. There is no proper training for antibiotics. So we need to train the people in infectious diseases remotely because we got only 100 heart specialists available right now. We got society, but the society conducts annual meeting and a couple of knowledge meetings every month. But as a subsector or as a sub society of the ID, we want to take more training program with the help of AI so that it's easy to train them. You tell a lot of things about the robotics and everything we can do training and simulation there. Because for example, the surgeon operates he got infected, the patient is getting infections, we need to follow what happened during the surgery, it's very difficult. So we need to do the analytics part also. So mainly it has two goings, how to train the people, simply because I am a clinician, I am a doctor, because we see patients and everything, but I need to know how to train the medical college students, as well as clinicians, regarding simple thing about antibiotics and infection control. And second thing, we are open to collaborations and research activity, whatever things is happening in the lab, we need to check in the patient said whether it's really working or not. So we are open to it. So, so please feel free to contact us. I'll share my email ID as this number. Anybody wanted to do research and collaborations, our society has us as an individual. We are very happy to support the people there. So I look forward and sincerely thanks for wonderful presentations. So this knowledge should be spread widely there. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Kumar. Dr. Suresh Kumar, I think uh, I just restricted myself to imaging. Now, one of the wonderful things that can be done uh, in is in uh, antibiotic policies. Now, uh, clinicians don't use antibiotic, uh, say what is called resistance or sensitivity because it is not dynamic. So mm -hmm. I created one model by which all microbiology uh, centers can upload uh, the sensitivity of their respective hospitals up and directly to the cloud where it is dynamically maintained and then uh, it's available for the clinicians uh, real time. So that suppose uh, today I have a patient I should know uh, to which antibiotic, uh, which bacterial sensitive in my hospital. So if it is dynamically available, the clinicians will use. I think this where is something where only AI can do. Uh, Apollo is doing uh, major work in uh, telemedicine. I think is pioneer in telemedicine. In fact, I when I approach Apollo for developing a smart ambulance, where uh, the ambulance becomes an extension counter of a emergency ward. And we wanted to uh, collaborate with, as a persistent system for developing uh, a smart ambulance where uh, every data is available. And then uh, we have gadgets, we have wearables, and everything could be gone, gone to cloud with 5G. Everything is very fast. And therefore, even streptokinase can be given in the ambulance. So I think uh, I just wanted more collaboration with Apollo. So maybe Dr. Suresh Kumar Kelly. Thank you. Sure. Can we have so, Dr. Murray, uh, Maria? Uh, for a quick question. Yes. Yes. Hello. Yes. I'm uh, Dr. Kalima, president of the Philippine Medical Association. I actually teach health informatics at the USA faculty uh, graduate school at the University of Santo Tomas. 
uh, and pharmacology at the uh, USC Faculty of Medicine and Surgery. So actually, our uh, the main uh, thing in uh, artificial intelligence is actually big data. So it's all dependent on what we upload. So for example, we want to do uh, antibiotic uh, stewardship and we want to know uh, uh, the uh, uh, resistance uh, patterns. We need to have uh, the antibiograms all uploaded in one system. Somebody has to uh, develop the uh, algorithms in order to look at the trends, no? the shifting patterns of uh, antimicrobial resistance. And um, in the Philippines, we actually have anti COVID, no? uh, that is uh, artificial intelligence applied to uh, COVID detection, COVID uh, uh, contact tracing, no? uh, and uh, it's ongoing up to now. So we're now in the process of uh, actually evaluating the outcomes of uh, the uh, Bantai COVID. A-N-T-A-I no, is a Bantai is to watch over in Filipino. But instead of A-Y, we use A-I because we use artificial intelligence for that. So uh, we hope to be able to know the results of our um, study regarding that. So uh, thank you very much for allowing me to share. Uh, by thank the way, you. I'm the new president of the PMA. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. I welcome you over here uh, and congratulations and happy new year. Uh, I would like you to join on all our uh, meetings which happen every Saturday. On this in time. Okay. See you. So uh, do we have any other questions on the floor? Dr. Sura, one question from my student. Can I ask? Please go ahead. Uh, let's quickly wind up the session after that. Yes. Yeah. She has asked that what are the risks associated with the usage of artificial intelligence in healthcare? I think this question was being asked and uh, Monica did cover that question. But uh, Dr. Janko, would you like to also uh, highlight this question? Actually, one of the one of the thing of all AI because it is all cloud based with the data and everything. One thing is privacy, second thing is security, and third thing uh, there might be inadvertent used, there might be some mishap going on. But I think that is because of personal things. And sometimes uh, all these technologies they are trying to what you call as overstate, and they become more ambitious. And you have to need to understand that it's a machine. And therefore, you require a doctor to find out uh, what exactly cannot be done. I think uh, we should try to find out what AI system cannot do. I think if you identify that and taken everything with a pinch of salt, and we are never saying that AI system will replace doctors. AI system will help doctors, and at the end, human intelligence is required to find out how effectively we can use. It can help to reduce the time. It can help to reduce and uh, maybe efficacy. And then because of uh, our system, we use with the human brain and you have limitation of uh, all our inputs. Whereas the AI system can help you with all these inputs to have a say, better suggestion for diagnosis and treatment. So uh, thank you so much. I see your comments from Dr. Monica. It says AI system can only make recommendation based on the data and algorithm they have been trained on if the data and algorithm are flawed the ai system could provide incorrect and harmful recommendation and also uh, uh, obviously the sensitivity of the medical data and uh, being used by the unauthorized parties so uh, do we have any other question quickly on the floor i do understand this topic is very very important and uh, in the interest of a lot of medical associations i would like to bring some more, uh, uh, you know, speakers and some more sessions on this particular topic. I also know there are a lot of things happening on MRI and CT scan and, and what I understood from the company who's working on it. This is one added layer where so much of data is present in this artificial intelligence that it can actually save life. It cannot replace a doctor. It just gives a help to a doctor to analyze and predict the disease much faster than what it 
is in a manual error and it, it avoids a manual error. So uh, any final comments, Dr. Chong and Dr. Monica or anyone, whoever is here, uh, I don't see any medical association raising a question right now. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jamka, for that wonderful uh, presentation. And honestly, yes, I think uh, the, the fear is that the design of these decision trees in, um, that they make in this, uh, you know, as a backbone of this AI is actually can be fraught with uh, a flawed design and so on. And really, uh, I mean, a lot of input is required from the medical community with the designers of these decision trees, these layers that you talk about and so on. Um, I, I've, I've actually had some experience in this uh, area of data science and it's uh, actually quite fascinating. And I've actually had a situation where uh, the decision tree was flawed and uh, the outcome was not what we wanted. So I, I, I to totally understand. But I think over time, as the designers get more and more experience and the medical community interacting with them becomes more and more experienced with this process, becomes more familiar, I think all these issues will slowly sort itself out. Uh, but thank you very much for that wonderful uh, presentation. And uh, in, more importantly, it's, it's stirred our interest and it stirred our mind and open our minds to the fact that this is here to stay. And uh, you know we should embrace it and we shouldn't be too frightened of it. So thank you everyone for this wonderful presentation. And I think we should have uh, more, more uh, discussions on this topic in the future. I, yeah, I thank you everyone. Any suggestions if you have a speaker who is good in this also, we can cover various uh, more aspects about it. And uh, let's cover this 2023 as an artificial intelligence from healthcare sector. Yeah, I think and that there is should be a series of the uh, presentation. There Absolutely. should be a series of presentations. We'll cover it. Thank you. So thank, thank you, you so much well. for joining in thank for you. this thank session. You. Uh, see you again uh, uh, for the next session. Happy New Year, everyone.